You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate and hotel repositioning and value add expert Justin Ford. Now, Justin specializes in hotels, motels, inns, and lodges, in addition to commercial and multifamily properties. Now, in addition to his real estate investments, he has published, edited, and written for over a dozen international investment newsletters. He launched the U.S. version of the Fleet Street Letter, the oldest continuously published newsletter in English language. One of his employees was a young Porter Stansberry. Now, Justin is the founder of Seeds of Wealth, a program for getting children to adopt good money habits from an early age. He is also the editor of the Seeds of Wealth Quarterly Investment Update Bulletin. Now, his investment approach to real estate can be summarized as follows. Number one, he only buys income producing properties at cash flow prices. Number two, he adequately capitalizes each investment property that he purchases. Number three, he only buys at or below market value. Number four, he follows cash flow fundamentals to avoid bubble markets. Number five, he finances conservatively, preferring fixed rate loans. And then number six, he chooses his tenants as carefully as he chooses his properties to invest in. And here's what you're going to learn on our show with Justin today. You're going to learn how Justin got started in smaller multifamily properties back in 2002 before shifting his focus into heavy value-add hotel properties in highly desirable locations throughout Florida. You'll learn how Justin has been able to stand out from all of the competitors on major booking sites such as Booking.com, Travelocity, and the many others. You'll learn why he prefers exterior corridor hotels over interior corridor properties. You're going to learn what best in class means to Justin and what specific tangible and intangible benefits he offers to help set him apart from the competition. You can learn why Justin prefers to abandon the flag, also known as the national brand name, when he acquires a new hotel property. You can learn how Justin retrains his existing staff members upon acquisition and allows those who don't conform to the changes to self-select out versus going in and cleaning house and hiring all new staff from the get-go. You can learn why Justin involves his staff in the annual budgetary planning process. Additionally, how he gets them involved in understanding the profit and loss of each property and the significant benefits that come as a result. And much, much more, guys. And so with that, I'm super excited to get onto it with Justin. But before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items. Like I do each and every week, I like to share my one personal and one professional best from the uh, the prior week. So with that being said, professional best. Uh, I had an incredible time at the Best Ever Conference in Keystone. Stone, Colorado this past weekend, had the opportunity to, to speak on a panel related to overcoming financial hardships. And now for those of you that don't know, my real estate business got crushed in 2008 and my world as I knew it practically came to an end. And then you know, over the period of, of, of that year, I lost about 90% of my investment properties, my personal home fell into foreclosure, and my personal and business bank accounts got garnished by creditors. Needless to say, it was an incredibly tough time for me. Well, I, I actually had the opportunity of sharing those dark times with the audience, but more importantly, I shared how I was able to rebuild myself and get back on top within the following years. And I'll say that speaking about this vulnerable time in my life in public is uh, is, is very emotional and, and, and humbling to say the least. However, my, my hopes are that it can offer clarity and some hope to those who might find themselves in a similar situation at some point. And aside from the panel, the networking at the best ever conference was absolutely phenomenal. Joe and his team do a great job. And, you know, always it's good to catch up with, you know, my close friends and also colleagues that have come to know over the years of uh, being in the investment world. Now, moving on to the uh, the, the personal best. So I kind of paired 
my business with pleasure on this particular trip. So I spent the first few days at the Best Ever Conference and then flew my wife and my two boys in so we could hit the, the slopes together there at Keystone. Uh, we put Jackson and Julian into two days of ski school and uh, they absolutely loved it, which is awesome. I was really hoping that they would grow fond of it and, uh, and, and have a huge passion for it like me and their mom do. So hopefully we'll have more family vacations here in the future uh, and get them into uh, you know to skiing and, and to love the sport. And so putting the kids at ski school left Joanne and I to have some fun on the mountain together, some adult fun. Uh, additionally, we met a few close friends of mine from Denver. They took the drive out and met us and spent some time on the mountain together. So guys, all in all, it was a hugely successful trip. Uh, also, one other thing, uh, uh, tomorrow morning, I'm actually hopping on a plane to head to Portland, Maine to view a property that we have our eyes set on purchasing. And, and uh, nope, it's not a mobile home park. This is uh, actually the second accepted LOI that I've received in the last three weeks. And yes, I am purposely being mysterious about it because we're not quite ready to roll out the news to the masses. And in case you're wondering, it's not multifamily, it's not self-storage or any of the other more common asset classes. So you just need to stay tuned to find out more. But um, we're super excited about this uh, this new angle that we're going to be going in. And uh, it's going to be in addition to mobile home parks, which is kind of our bread and butter. And so just stay tuned and uh, I'll be sure to release the amazing news here in the coming episodes. And so guys, moving on here, if you love what we're doing here at the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show, but also take a moment to leave a review and rating. It really helps us grow the show and attract awesome guests to future episodes. Uh, lastly, before we get on to the show with Justin, just want to remind you of the free 30-minute phone call that I offer each and every Friday. You can go to my website, kevinbup.com to get signed up. And this is where you can get on the phone with me to discuss anything and everything your heart desires about real estate investing, whether you're brand new to the business or a seasoned investor. I love connecting with those that share a similar passion for real estate as I, and I promise you, I will not pitch you or try to sell you anything on that call. It's just a way for me to connect with my listeners. So again, go to kevinbup.com to get signed up for that free call. And now guys, without further ado, let's get on to the part of the show that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Justin Ford. So here we go. All right, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, CEO and founder of PAX Properties, Justin Ford. Justin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kevin. Thank you very much for inviting me on the show. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us here. Very, very much looking forward to, to having you on and, and diving into a discussion about you and your business and some of the exciting projects that you have working here today. But uh, Justin, for those folks that are tuning in that might not be familiar with you and your background, uh, uh, maybe take a few minutes, tell us a little bit about your, your story and ultimately how you got into real estate. Sure. Um, we're a small company, uh, Kevin. We've, we've done a little over a thousand units. Um, our modest claim to fame is that I started around 2002 with little houses and duplexes and so forth. Um, and then through the boom and the bust, we've, we've done a little over a thousand units in maybe nine different cities. Um, we've done probably $75 million worth of real estate. And uh, we never lost an investor a dollar. We were never late on a mortgage payment. Um, that's not because we, uh, we don't make mistakes. We make plenty of them. Um, but we were fairly conservative. We try to buckle down. We focus on operations, which is key, executing the plan that you have and executing your adjusted plan once you adjust it, which is uh, usually the case because the plan never goes from exactly how you conceive it to the end. Um, and uh, we, uh, it's paramount to us to honor our, our, our obligations. Um, so we tend to make it through the tough times and then we get to enjoy um, good stabilized properties at the end of it. Um, today our portfolio consists of uh, six hotels and two apartment complexes plus a few smaller properties as well. Okay, fantastic. I pr appreciate that background. So, you know, one of the immediate questions that come to mind is, um, you know, really that, that transitionary stage of, of starting with small properties, single family or duplexes, and, and actually moving into the bigger leagues with multifamily and especially hotels. What did that transition look like for you, Justin? Well, um, I'll tell you. So in 2009, I woke up one day at three in the morning. I had about 40 units at the time, maybe 10 or a dozen properties. And I, I had been writing, uh, contributing essays to a newsletter, an online newsletter, um, mm -hmm. since about 2004. And I was predicting the crash, basically, for a number of reasons. You know, properties didn't cash flow for investors and for uh, homeowners that couldn't afford to buy the, own, the, the home they actually lived in at that moment anymore. So there were a bunch of fundamental things that were dramatically off skew. Another one was, for instance, buildings were trading at four caps while the, while the 10-year treasury was 4%. So there was a bunch of crazy stuff where I knew... <clears throat> I knew that it had to become undone. And so I stopped buying multiple properties in South Florida in 2004 
and I started to buy and I recommended other markets. Austin was my number one market, which never crashed. Um, but the long and the short is, um, in 2009, I wake up and I realized that day that my properties had fallen more than I expected. So even though I predicted, I was more underwater than I, than I had expected. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit, uh, a bit bummed out. And I said, boy, is this my life now? I have to be tied forever to these crummy little properties because I can't afford to sell them because I, I don't have enough money to pay off the mortgage. And I thought, well, what would I do um, if, I, um, if I didn't own these properties? And I thought, well, prices are so low, I would buy. So I said, well, I'm not going to worry about these properties. I'm just going to the, keep the right management in there, make them, let them pay themselves off. I'm just going to focus on buying. So I started to buy, 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 and buy. Um, I started buying every little house I could, little duplex. I was buying houses for $50,000 that I sold you know, a few years later for $150,000. Duplexes for I don't know what, 60, 70 that I sold. So I was buying all these little properties. And then I realized, I think it was around 2000, late 2009, 2010, I realized, wow, they got some great deals on, on the 10 and 14-unit properties. In fact, in, in 2007, I bought a 14-unit property too. But so it was like, the market, I don't know if you remember those days, the market was like $50 bills were floating around on your feet. You just pick them up, $50, $100 bills. But if you looked up in the trees and stopped bending down, there were thousands, there were you know, bundles of thousands of dollars up there you could grab the trees. <laughs> so if you could resist the temptation to buy the little guys and have a little more focus to train yourself, now I started buying 10 and 14 unit properties, put together mm -hmm. a portfolio of those. Um, probably did about six in that range. And then one day... I'm driving uh, through Lake Worth where I had a bunch of little properties. A broker calls me on the phone and he goes, hey, Justin, I got this good deal in this little hotel right by where you have a bunch of properties. It's a 22-unit hotel and um, called the Scandia Lodge. And we still own it to this day. And um, so I drove by and I'd seen it before. It's a charming little you know, L-shaped property with barrel tile roof mm -hmm. and this beautiful little court courtyard with mature growth around. So it's got this Shangri-La feel to it. And the price was price was like they were giving it away. So I thought, boy, I called my property manager and I said, hey, Debbie, if I can't figure out how to run a hotel, could you rent these out as studios for like five fifty a month? She says, all day long. And I said, okay, we're going into the hotel business. So that, that's how we transitioned from small to medium to the hotel. And then we bought the one next door that was 20 units about six months later. All these things we're buying from banks at this time, for the most mm -hmm. part. And, uh, and then it was only a year later in 2013, that we bought our first 100 plus unit property. That was 117 unit property in Vero Beach, which we uh, renamed the Vero Beach Inn and Suites. And uh, that one was bought on the same premise. It was our first big one, but the price was so low. I thought, gee, if we can't understand how to execute a larger scale hotel, mm -hmm. we, could, uh, we could do a fallback position. And Got since it. then, we've, we've learned a, quite a bit about hotels and um, we've had a bit of success, which uh, I'd be pleased to uh, share with you a little bit later. Yeah, no, that, and that's a, that's an interesting transition. So, you know, single family, small duplexes to uh, medium sized multifamily, and then moving into the hotel space, which is a, you know, the, there's similarities, but there's also uh, major variances there as well from the day-to-day -day operations and even the demographic that you're serving. And so, um, very, very excited to kind of dive down that rabbit hole and talk about hotels. It's a topic that we've covered on the show before. Uh, however, it is not one that is uh, uh, covered on a regular basis. And so uh, very much looking forward to learning about that side of your business. And so let's talk about, let's just use that, you know, to start the conversation off, uh, you know, that very first, that, I think you said Scandia, Scandia Lodge. Yep. Um, let's use that one as the example. I know that you kind of went into it, you know, you always got a plan B, right? So the plan A was, I'm going to run it and operate just like a hotel, which is what it's, you know, what it yep. is today in its current state. Uh, however, uh, plan B would be if I absolutely, you know, suck at the hotel model right. and I'm a horrible operator, I'm going to do what I know best, which is run it as a multifamily property and just right. you know, basically rent out these studio units, studio units on a monthly or annual basis. And so let's talk about that first dive into the hotel operations. Um, what were some of the things that you were unaware of that kind of smacked you in the face, right? When you jumped into it, uh, how'd you overcome those hurdles? And then ultimately, what'd you decide long-term as far as the operations of that property? Is it today a hotel or is it a multifamily property? Uh, it's still a hotel today. Okay. Um, the, um, so when I got in there, I, um, I, I, here's one thing I knew, no matter what business you're in, if I, if tomorrow I found myself in the dry cleaning or the, business because I was buying a, a franchise store or, or the, uh, 
or a shoe store or something like that, even if I, even if I knew nothing about it, I've learned that the first three things you got to do in any business is sell, 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 right? Because you got to get the revenue. If, if what you have is, is so, so it's kind of beat up. You want to make it much better, but it's operating right now. You still have to max sales right now in its current condition because that cash, you're going to, it's going to be part of your, your war chest to reinvest in that property, to give it new life, to improve it and so forth. So, so I, was, so I tried to learn as quickly as possible, what are the distinguishing characteristics of a hotel? Obviously, this is a small little exterior corridor hotel in mm -hmm. a sort of bohemian downtown area. And um, I started asking questions of, of people that worked in the industry. And I can remember uh, one guy going, um, well, it's got to be clean. That's the, the number one thing is it's got to be clean. I was like, it was like an insight for me. I was like, wow, clean. That's so, you know. And it's amazing, <laughs> right? Because obviously in apartments, in apartments, we, you know, you, you finish your apartment, you're renting it out, you're going to have it clean when you're showing it. There's no, no question. When the tenants move and you, and you turn it, you're going to clean it again. There's no question. But the, the battle in hotel is it has to be clean every single day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you have to clean and re-clean and so forth, and the exteriors and all this kind of thing. And you have a huge amount of traffic going through there. So as simple as that sounded, I knew that was one of the most crucial things. The other thing that I, that I knew tied to the sell, 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 was that I came from a large, um, a fairly extensive marketing and sales background. Also, you know, dealing with uh, economics and investments and things like this. So I knew that I wanted to do every little thing that would give us an incremental advantage, you know, one or two extra sales that other folks weren't necessarily doing because they didn't think it was the primary thing. They were only doing the primary thing. Maybe they were on some major reservation system like Expedia. I mm -hmm. wanted to be in every everywhere in in, uh, in marketing. We talk about uni I talk about universal presence. So if they're selling room there, and it's you know whether it's Flipkey or Expedia or Booking dot com, now m much of it is amalgamated because uh, the big guys have bought all the little guys. Mm -hmm. But you know even even Craigslist, which is questionable for hotels because it can it can draw um, an undesirable type of guest. But if you position your ad quickly uh, correctly, you could still use it well. You know for extended stays for people traveling for business or construction jobs or whatever it is. Um, I want it to be absolutely everywhere. And so, um, so we bought in 2000, end of 2012, it was a money losing operation, but every year since then we've, we've made um, fairly good profits. And we bought the, um, from good to fairly good profits, let's say. And we bought the property next door, which is a 20 unit apartment building, um, which, could, which could run as both apartments and hotels because 17 of those 20 units have kitchens. We bought those in May, uh, the following May, so six months after we bought the Scandia, and we started to run them both simultaneously, so we could benefit a little bit of, uh, from scale on those 42 units. Um, so to answer your question concisely, the, um, the thing about, uh, for me, the, the core to hotels is um, you, want, you, want, you want great, you want, you want to be super clean. Here's, here's, here's what, and, there's, and you want great service. So here's where we operate, Kevin. Everything we have is exterior corridor at hotel. We, we, we tend to, what we do is we transform ugly ducklings into swans. That's what we do for a living. Mm -hmm. And we help people realize their potential. So everything we've bought so far is exterior corridor. May we change? Sure, going forward. We just found that's where the deals were incredibly cheap. You're picking up stuff at such low value that we could, we could invest in it and we could create a far superior product to everything in, it, in its comp set, everything in its price range, everything in its category and have a considerable margin of safety, not having invested too much per unit. And so um, we, we started to do this with um, the Scandian Amen, because they were small, we started to grow after that. We kind of left them in the category they were, but we, we take good care of them. But in others, we try to deliver um, what we call um, extraordinary value for people of ordinary means. And so the way we look at it when, we, when, when I talk to my group is there's two things we do. In any one of our hotels, I'm talking about the 100 plus units now, we got uh, one in Vero, one in Melbourne, one in Ocala, two in Tallahassee. In any one of those hotels, um, I tell them, I'm giving you, the operators, the managers, you have the best in, you have the, you have the best in class tangibles, you need to deliver world class intangibles. So the tangibles, of course, is everything you can touch, the rooms, the amenities, the lobby, the public areas, all that stuff, we always have best in class. If you're, if you're staying in, in any of our, like in Melbourne tonight, and you're spending, I don't know what we're charging in Melbourne tonight. It's, it's high season, so maybe we're 150 or something like that. If you're spending anywhere from 125 to $175 in Melbourne tonight, you might have 20 choices. If you could visit every one of those hotels, 
I would say 99.9, if not 100% of the time, you would choose our hotel every time. We, we have by far the best, and I'll get specific on this in a moment, in the tangibles. And then what does world-class intangibles mean? Well, you know, because of my previous uh, job, previous work in the, in the publishing career, I've had the fortune to stay at some of the top hotels in the world. So I stayed, for instance, at the uh, Ritz-Carlton in Shanghai. Uh, the week I left, uh, George Bush, who was then president, stayed at the same hotel. It was, it was that level hotel. In that hotel, I called to ask them to bring me an iron. They sent a butler. It was that kind of hotel. That's an actual true story. It was beautiful. And so I said, look, in our hotels, um, we, we, can, we, can make, we can make a bed as well as, as they do. We can clean a room as well as they do. We can smile as well as they do at the Ritz-Carlton, and we can make a person feel as welcome. So the class of service doesn't have to be any lower as far as, mm -hmm. as, far as those fundamentals go. And we have best in, in category uh, tangibles. So that is where we try to distinguish ourselves. And so far, um, we've had a great deal of success doing that. Um, and for me, it's very gratifying, you know, because everyone likes to kiss the ring of the rich, sell hotel rooms for $600 a day. But um, very few people are, are doing what we're doing. We're, we're, we're in that boutique space almost, even though we have larger units. And I always say one day we'll take pity on the rich, we'll build them a hotel. But right now, the cool stuff is happening in our space. We're, we're you know, every, every day people are enjoying great, great uh, places to stay. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. I appreciate that background. I've got a lot of questions uh, that I want to make sure that we, that we cover. Um, I, I'm going to make the assumption, I think, based on the operational side, you guys are managing your properties yourself or do you have a yes. third party management company? We self-manage. Okay. Okay. And then as far as the, uh, uh, the brands of these hotels, uh, do you have any national flags or are these your own brand? So we have only one flag. Uh, we have five independents. Every time we picked up these, ho these hotels, we have next, when they had a brand, we nixed them. So the first one was American mm -hmm. Best Value. We paid like 10 grand to get rid of it. Uh, last year we picked up a Quality Inn. We paid like 75,000 to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, we picked up a Baymont in Tallahassee and that was a bit more expensive. And I decided for strategic reasons to leave that flag on. Um, I wanted to have the, have the franchise experience and compare it with our independent experience. So we prefer to have independence, especially in the category we're operating, because we feel we bring far more value to that property than the flag does. Um, that if we were, for instance, if some of our properties, we call them quality in, we think we'd probably be doing a disservice to our property because our property is far superior, uh, mm -hmm. not, to, not to knock them, but far superior than, than almost any quality in you'll find. And I'll give you one quick example. So Melbourne, we, we bought Melbourne, it's 235 uh, rooms on, on eight unforgiving acres of asphalt on, on New Haven Avenue in uh, one hour out of, out of Orlando in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I looked at it, I was picking up very cheap. I was picking up like 10 grand a door out of uh, bankruptcy. And I looked at it and I thought, what am I gonna do with this thing? Maybe I'll just knock it down <clears throat> and build a storage or something like that. Um, because it's just, it's just a blight, concrete bunkers, a lot of asphalt. Then I thought, you know, to compete, I don't need 235 rooms at the price I'm getting this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make all suites. So I reduced it to 140 suites, 102 room suites and 40 junior wow. suites. Mm -hmm. And now I didn't need as much parking. So everywhere I, need, I could, I just tore up asphalt and I planted everywhere. And also they had this ugly IHOP out front with an old roof I, mm -hmm. and, a, and an old concrete port cochet that you drive under. I tore down the, port, uh, uh, the concrete port cochet, put out this beautiful awning. I tore off the roof. I, I popped in three dormers. I popped in side windows. I put on a metal roof and I changed it from ugly IHOP to beautiful sort of almost Key West style. And we put shutters in all the windows and in all, all the rooms in the hotels, we tore out the curtains where you, where you get smoke and mildew and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we put up plantation shutters. We tore up the carpets. We put in those wood plank tiles, uh, uh, porcelain tile floors. They're not, they're not uh, the easy ones to put in the vinyl. We, we put in the wood tile. Uh, we did all these things. We, we upgraded the vanities. And so Melbourne, this property, which was, um, which it was the number one, uh, it was, it was the most visited place by police in Melbourne when we bought it. Oh, wow. <laughs> after, after we finished, um, within like, I don't know, a month or something, even while we were finishing construction, we won the TripAdvisor Award of Excellence. Every, every year since then, we've won the TripAdvisor Award of Excellence. We went from last place in Melbourne to like number two. Now we're right on number four and that, on TripAdvisor. And we'll get back to number two. We're shooting for number one. We, um, we're, we're above every ocean-ranked hotel in, the pro in, in, in that category concept. Why? Just because we please our customers more, apparently, than the oceanfront hotels, 
please their customers. That's all. It doesn't mean we're a better property. It means we work very hard for in our category to blow away, deliver more value than other hotels do. And uh, today that hotel this year should be on track to uh, gross around three million, um, produce profits of around 900,000. Hotels are a different animal than apartments as far mm -hmm. as margins go. And, uh, and you know, we, we employ somewhere between 35 and 40 people there. Very exciting. Very exciting. So one of the questions that, that I have there regarding, let, let's use that as an example, uh, how, you know, based on, you know, the, the different, you know, websites that are out there, your booking.com, uh, Travelocity, you know, orbits.com. I mean, there's a million sites and they got VRBO, HomeAway, Airbnb, depending on what demographic and what type of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, individual you're going after to stay at your, 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 uh, your hotel or extended stay. Um, when you're buying these, these somewhat distressed assets, uh, you know, they have a bad reputation. They've got poor reviews yeah. across the board. All these different websites probably have got folks have horrific things to say about them, especially if it was the most visited place by the police uh, in that local marketplace. I called it, uh, a lot of these websites. Sorry, yeah. I called it the Chateau Ghetto. Yeah, that was pretty right. funny. That's great. <laughs> no, right. that's not a good name. It's a funny name, but not a great name, especially <laughs> if you own the property, right? right yeah. How do you go about rebranding? Now, I know you can come in, you can spend a lot of money, you can visually right. change the appearance, but uh, do a lot of these websites allow you to basically, new owner comes in, do they give you a, a restart? I mean, can you get rid of the old right. reputation fairly quickly and actually start with a fresh basis as far as social reviews are concerned? Yeah, so we, we learned that the hard way. So when we bought the, uh, the Vero Beach Inn, the Vera Beach Inn, we, we made um, far nicer than it was, but we didn't understand that. We didn't, we didn't reach out to TripAdvisor, tell them all the investors were making, tell them that we were new owners and so forth. So for basically, for our first two years, we had that legacy of poor reviews and old photos mm. uh, attached to our hotel. So it really, it really cost us a lot. Uh, we, learned, we, learned, um, we learned to do differently um, by the time we did Melbourne, which was our second big hotel. And so we reached out to TripAdvisor right away. We told them about the new ownership management. We proved our new CapEx and everything else. And, you know, not only did we win that award, we shot from last place to number two in the market on the rankings. And the county came out and did a, did a ribbon cutting with us and gave us a beautification award. So people now do know very well who we are. So Pax Properties is kind of recognized as a sub-brand, I would almost say. And I'll give you an example. The most... The most astounding property we have, I'm, I'm so pleased with it. It's, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful property. We just finished it. Uh, we've given it uh, we have given it the name of Seven Hill Suites in Tallahassee. And you can go to that website, sevenhillsuites.com. This is absolutely beautiful. So this was another case where this was basically a no-tell motel. Uh, and, we, and it had all those reputation. It was, it was very low rated in the market. It was towards the very last uh, rated one. Um, we had our grand opening December 19th. Since then, the last I looked, we've had, and because we cut it, this goes to your answering your question, because we cut those old ones, for a little while after the grand opening, you would, you would click on TripAdvisor, and you'd even see re uh, photos of the hotel before renovation. But we've acted quick. We got rid of that and all stuff. Anyhow, we, we have, let's call it 40, well, I don't know, maybe 50 reviews almost. We have something like 45-star reviews. We have eight four-star and only one three-star, and that's it. And... Um, and we are now, we, we went from last place in the market to number 13. This is only in two months. And uh, we're the only five-star hotel in Tallahassee right now as far as TripAdvisor is concerned. And you talk about reputation. Um, so the other day, uh, I, was, I was there last week, the mayor of Tallahassee came, uh, came over just by himself. Um, he had been invited to our grand opening. He couldn't make it, but he swang by just by himself. Really an amazing guy, uh, Bill Daly. And he came by and he said, um, he asked for me and we himself, me, and my general manager, we took him on a tour, and he was so impressed with what we had done, um, and he, he connected, you know, we're going to have a meeting with their city about other opportunities, development opportunities they're doing, um, and the same time, I think it was the day before that, or might have even been that day, um, I, had, I had someone from uh, the head of tourism, I believe, of uh, Port St. Lucie called me, and she had heard about what we're doing, and she... Um, uh, and, and they, they very much like what we do and, you know, they like that we transform things for people again of ordinary means. <clears throat> and, um, and so we're, we're going to be visiting that, that community soon and see if there's development opportunities where we can help, help them realize their visions that coincide with our vision. Um, so the this, short this is the major question, transformation. I'm actually just came to the website. This is a, I, there's a couple old pictures here still. Right kind of scattered right. through, but right. what a major transformation you guys did. Wow. Yeah. I mean, like night, night and day difference. Yeah. 
mind me asking, um, you know, what type of uh, cost per door, a uh, renovation cost per door, you guys uh, set aside uh, or budgeted for this or where you ended up? Yeah, so far too much. Um, but I would say, <laughs> yeah, that's a nice project. I mean, yeah. definitely, it, it's um, from a zero to a hero for sure. That's yes. Um, we, we probably spent, including everything, about 40 a door on renovations. Okay. We, bought it for, we bought it for 20, and, but with soft costs and all then all that were probably in around 65 a door, which you still couldn't build it for that. You know, you couldn't come close mm-hmm. to building it at 65 a door. So we're, we're below replacement costs and, and it has a beautiful layout. You know, it has nine sloping acres. It's got the, uh, the lodge it used to be a Cabot lodge on top. And then it's got the residential buildings sort of on steps below. And in between we built this tremendous, um, pool, courtyard, pergola, uh, and lazy river area. That is just uh, really stunning. And it's just, and, and the lobby itself is beautiful inside. We, we, we knocked down walls, so we created this circular space. Uh, we knocked down the interior walls, we created a circular space. And then we, we opened up exteriors. We, we put in something like a dozen French doors, windows, overlooking this beautiful property. It, it's, it has a wraparound porch. Um, you know, we rehabilitated that, put in all these nice, beautiful, quiet fans. We have rocking chairs out there. We have, we have swinging love benches, love seat benches. Um, and it's just, it has, it has the best of old Southern charm and also really cool and interesting and fun modern style. So it's a great, mm-hmm. it's a great mixture of the two, I think. And people are, are reacting to it, you know, just wonderful. And also I want to give a, I want to give credit to my sister, Allison, who our interior designer, I reach out. She's a professional set designer in New York. And when I buy properties, I go up there and I, usually I fly her down and, and I tell her about my general vision and she helps do things and she comes up with stuff mm-hmm. like the furniture and she always does the lobbies and the restaurants and uh, she has helped create really a, a beautiful, beautiful place there. Yeah. She's done a great job. So you. you put all the money into it. You're, you're into it for 60 or 65 a door. I mean, major transformation guys. Uh, you know, if you're listening here, go <laughs> check out the website, um, seven hills suites.com. Uh, you can actually, you know, just Google it and you can find some of the older photographs of what it looked like and see what it looks like today. I mean, it is a night and day difference. And so the next you know, question I have is, you know, you, you've spent all the money. Now you've gotten a very aesthetically pleasing end product, right. but we know that staff makes or breaks this yeah. business, right? That's the operational true. side and, and the staff. Um, and so talk to me about, making the transition from, you know, I'm assuming you pretty much have to clean house, right? From, from old staff to new, it's really hard to break old habits. And so how do you go about making that transition with the staff and getting them on board with this new vision? Mm-hmm. You know, cause it's, it's again, hard to break old habits. It's hard to, to get people to see what the future might look like and get them excited about it. So how do you guys go about doing that? And, and not just doing it initially, but keeping that intact. Right. Right. So, um, we, we don't generally clean house when we go inside. So when we go in, when we take over a property, we, um, we start to communicate. We put in our systems, our processes, and, um, and a lot of people self-select out. You know, mm-hmm. people are not, be, are not used to a, any, any standard at all or being held accountable. They tend to uh, select themselves out. Got it. Um, so what you're talking about might, might be put under the umbrella of culture, right? What are, what's our vision? Mm-hmm. What's our aspirations? How, how do we do things? And, and why do we do things the way we do? So we have, we have, we have a bunch of messages around that. And um, so when I bought my first property in Vero, it was easy for me to communicate that to the staff. It's true. When I bought Vero, it also has a bar and restaurant. Um, so that, you know, that has around 40 to 45 people when you include the bar and restaurant there. And I, I sat down with, um, with every single employee one by one. I sat down with the, uh, with the front desk, the, uh, the maids, uh, the main, every single person one by one. And I said, Hey, you know, tell me what you like and don't like about this place. Tell me if, if you were in control, what would you do to make this place better? And I had conversations with every single one. And I got some good feedback and I got some crazy feedback. Like I remember the night auditor, that's the guy who works the overnight shift. Mm-hmm. He told me that, you know, every time he went to the vending machine, the Skittles were, were like stale. So we should order the candy more often. So <laughs> that wasn't, that didn't help us really break away from the pack. <laughs> but but this is what we do. We, we do like to talk to folks. And, and often you will have, even in Chromium Hotels, you'll have very good people sometimes. And, and they just didn't have the right leadership, the right support. They didn't have sure. any belief or any vision. <clears throat> um, I'll give you one more example. In Ocala, we bought the quality in. And that was not a Chromium Hotel. That was, that was number 13 in its market when we bought it. So they had done a fair job. And we're, we're renovating it right now. But the, um, uh, the housekeeping manager there, Lola, 
she's been there. Jeez, she might be, she might be mad at me if I said the amount of years, but a, a lot of years, like almost twenty or something like that. And she's exceptional. She's just exceptional. And and you go in there. We 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 have good to very good housekeeping in our, in our properties. Occasionally we have challenges, um, but but she her her property is the best in housekeeping. There's no reason we would want to. Uh, you know, do wholesale change out at that same property. There's, there's a young woman who'd been running as a GM there, I think for seven years. And so we took it over and we kept her in and we trained her Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and she never, and and in her first year, she said that she'd been there like 12 years and I think seven as GM. She's also sales manager for a while there. And I, and I think in one year she got much more training than she ever did during the 12 years. She's learned much more. We, we make all our managers very financially, uh, aware as well, we want them to be plugged into the into the uh, into the P and L. Um, so for us, it's 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 really it's really it, it's personally really gratifying. We transform these old properties in, into something beautiful, something new, and we help people transform their careers into something rewarding, uh, something that has opportunity and growth. Uh, so, so that's what we, we try to do. Um, I think I'm being a little bit off the track of the core of your question. Would you remind me of the core of your question? No, no, and that's 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 fine. But I I, I have a question regarding the PL, getting them involved in the PL. So do you actually have them also involved in the uh, per property budgetary planning process on an annual basis? Are they yes. are they part of that conversation? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. In okay. fact, um, very interesting. They, yeah. So our, our any uh, any property we've had for a while, the PL is based typically on, on the previous year's uh, mm-hmm. performance. And then it's based on sort of benchmarks in our portfolio overall. Our, our portfolio overall. So, for instance, we know that, that roughly um, um, to clean a room, a regular hotel room, takes us on average about 29 minutes, regardless of what hotel you're in, except for Melbourne, because Melbourne we have a lot of two-room suites. So in Melbourne, the, it's about closer to, I think, 44 or 45 minutes. So we know that we should be budgeting – Roughly, what your what your salary, what your housekeeping salary plus tax insurance and benefits is for that housekeeper, roughly half that or or seventy five percent of that, depending on uh, on which property uh, per room that you sell. So so we we work in those and um, and every one of our managers has things called a checkbook as well. So every month they know that the uh, their budget spend this much on soap, uh, they have this much labor budget in in their mm-hmm. housekeeping according to uh, room sold, and they're adjusting as they go. The only thing that they cannot underspend on, uh, for instance, if they're over budget on their light bulbs or something, they maybe they have enough soap, they'll, they'll hold off on spending soap for the next, next month or something, but they can't underspend on linen. They must fully spend their linen budget every single month because you want your linens always to be fresh. You don't want to be, quote, unquote, saving on them and, and having them become uh, you know, thin or, or worn out uh, excessively. So... Um, we, we have very safeguarded, uh, a lot of uh, systems and processes where these folks are watching their, their labor costs, which is your number one cost, and all their other costs, and they're, they're gauging against it. In fact, all of our hotels, the GMs, besides, besides being part of monthly p and uh, reviews, put out three times a week a forecast. So they put out a for, actually, I'm sorry, they put out the forecast, I believe, five times a week, it goes out in the email. But three times a week, they also put out a budget variation calculation worksheet, which basically means, okay, we, we thought we were going to sell 250000 Now we're going to sell, whatever, 230. dollars we're, we're having a little more difficult than we were. We thought we were going to make on that two fifty eighty thousand. dollars Now, because we're, making, uh, we're going to sell twenty less right now, we only want that to reduce our EBITDA by $10,000. Mm-hmm. So are we, in, we, want to, we want a flow through of 50%. If we're selling 20000 more than we expected, we want to add to our EBITDA by at least $10,000. We want, again, a flow mm-hmm. through of at least 50%. So these folks are plugged into all these systems and processes. We are fairly, um, I would say, fairly sophisticated. I don't want to overstate it, but we're very honed in on that because I'll mm-hmm. give you one last statement it's before important. I pause. The, I tell folks this. I, I tell our GMs, really, you are profit managers. And the reason you're profit managers is because profit is the key to the business. And it's not because of Gordon Gecko or greed or any crazy thing like that. Profit is like oxygen. You know, it might make up the net income might make up five, six, seven percent of your whole operation, but you can't live without it. Right. You can hold your breath for a little while, but if it goes on too long, you're in real trouble. 
So I have a whole spiel around profit. And I'll give you the, the 10 second version. The first dollar profit means you've just paid everyone. That's all it means. You've honored your obligations. You've made your payroll, your taxes, your insurance, your vendors, et cetera. The next, uh, the next few hundred thousand dollars of profit, depending on the property, goes to pay the bank. They help to make uh, your, your purchase possible, the business possible, so you're paying them back. Uh, the next few hundred, uh, maybe 50 to 75 to 100,000, depending on the size of the property, that goes towards reserves. Because everything that is built must be rebuilt over time, stick by stick, stone by stone. The AC that you put in today, you're going to have to replace seven or eight years from now. The paint job today, four or five years from now, et cetera. So you have to reinvest in your, in, in your property. The next few hundred thousand dollars, those goes to the investors. That's their preferred return, their distributions. Investors put money in first, they get money out last. They get paid after the paychecks. So profit is not above all. Profit actually comes at the end of the line. And these investors, I have investors, I know very many of my investors personally. And they're tremendous folks. You know, I have brothers who have invested, who brought their mom in to invest and have invested in six, seven, eight deals. And these are folks who've been like fire chiefs and owned grocery stores and all this kind of stuff. They've worked hard, they've sacrificed, they didn't consume everything they made, and they've, mm -hmm. they've put aside a portion for their future, for their retirement, for their kids, for their legacy. And they've entrusted that with us. And in my mind, there's nothing more important, more valuable than you give a healthy person the trust and opportunity. That's a sacred trust. Mm -hmm. So we do everything we can. We can fail. Thank you know. Thankfully, we haven't. Uh, we've always um, produced positive returns. Have lost money, but we can. But, but we can never fail because of lack of care, lack and lack of understanding of our obligations. Never. And um, <clears throat> so um, that goes there. Then you get the investors paid. Then after that, then anything after that is extra. That's the land of extra. And extras where bonuses, where raises, where growth comes from. And that's where we all get jazz. We start reinvesting our people as well. So they, we try to hammer that home so that when they're focused on the numbers, it's, it's like they're taking care of, um, it's like they're taking care of people. They're, that's basically what they're doing. When they're delivering the budget and numbers, they're taking care of everyone, everyone involved. Well, it's important. I mean, the, the average employee, whether it be in a hotel or multifamily or any other type of business, typically does not have that financial literacy or transparency of that nature uh, to understand, uh, you know, the, the inner workings of that business. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a very high level understanding that they have. And so you getting deep in the weeds with them, I mean, you're, you're basically aligning them with, with your interest and, and they understand now, like I create my own job security you know, it's up to me if I, if I truly want to meet this bonus, I know how to get there. I know how to get right. from point A to point Z. I know how to actually achieve those incentives that are outlined for me, what have you. Um, it, it's a beautiful thing. You know, all across the board, it's a beautiful thing. I love every bit of, of that. And uh, um, I know we don't have, we're running out of time here. And so I would love, there's so many more questions I have about, you know, the rollout of that and, and, and you know, the uh, intimate details of what that program looks like in your business. I mean, because right. speaking of a higher level, like it sounds so easy theoretically of, oh yeah, we just, we get them involved in the PL, uh, P and L on a monthly basis and get them involved in the budgetary conversations. But rolling that out is a completely different animal, right? Especially rolling out amongst many different properties when you've got hundreds of employees, right. uh, completely different ball game and doing that in an efficient manner and getting everyone on board and on the same page. So, but we don't have time for but Maybe another time we'll bring you back in the show and actually have a conversation solely based around that because I think it's important okay. and it's very relevant no matter what business that you're in. I agree. I'd actually get your, your employees bought into that process and, and give them a firm understanding of uh, the operational side of that business so that they can better assist you uh, create a more profitable property and a better experience for the customers that you're serving. Absolutely. hundred percent. Moving on here, uh, Justin, again, just want to be conscious of the time, respectful of your time here. Um, I want to move on to the, what we call the, the lightning round. And this is where I'm going to ask you just six very short, concise questions, looking for six uh, short, concise answers, and uh, just to get a better understanding of you on a personal level. Uh, so the first one here, your biggest fear, what is it? Um, not meeting my obligations. Um, okay. not, not delivering what I said I would do for folks who were, who were um, counting on me, investing me in any way, mm -hmm. personally or, or professionally. Got it. How about your one biggest regret? Oh, my one biggest regret. Well, I, um, I, I'm, uh, I've been divorced 10 years and I have an, an excellent, uh, a wonderful ex-wife. We have a very great relationship. Um, she loves my family. I love hers. We, she and I get along great and all that. Um, just to be honest, um, um, I, um, I, I, I wished I had, I'd, um, Take, I, we had exited a little bit better 
when when we when we parted ways. But I'm so grateful about our relationship today. We have, we have a great relationship. In fact, when I finish this, I got to go over her house and I'm walking her dog. She's out of the country right now. And I'm going to okay. look in on, on <laughs> my mother-in-law, who's a, one of my favorite people in the whole world. Fantastic. How about the most influential business book? Oh, there's so many of them. Um, I'm going to tell you this. Most influential business figure is Warren Buffett to me. And it's not because of the billions. Yes. I've never. Love it. I, don't, I mean, it's because he doesn't care about the billions. I live in a fair, I mean, that's mm-hmm. probably an overstatement, but he's not, he's not about gold plated this. And, you know, he's, he's a very simple, humble, down to earth guy. And he always, um, I believe, speaks the truth as he sees it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and he's, his insights are brilliant. I love reading his reports. His, his annual reports online, they're, they're brilliant. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I actually live in one of my formal rental properties because I moved in here when we got divorced to be near my kids. I, I fixed it up, you know. But it's a simple little thing, a simple neighborhood. And I'm very happy here. Um, mm-hmm. So I find a great kinship with him. And uh, I would love the opportunity to meet him and to talk with him uh, one day. I, I, w- I couldn't care if he invested a dollar with us. That's not the reason. No, uh, I agree. No, I, I feel the same I, way about him. We're yeah, on the same page. I, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's Yoda for me. He's Yoda. Yep, yep, I agree. I agree. Yeah. How about outside the daily work, Ryan? What do you do to decompress? Um, well, I got a few friends where we, uh, we get together, we exercise and so forth. So um, I used to do a little boxing a while ago, and um, I'm 59 and change now. So I don't step in the ring anymore. But, but we get together, we hit the mitts and so forth. And, uh, and when I'm doing it regularly, it's, it's awesome. And recently, um, I was with my kids. I got three grown boys in New York. A couple of times I went bouldering where you're climbing up the walls, you know? Uh, okay. you know, I was on the easier courses, like the zeros and the ones. And my kids are like spider monkeys. You know? it, it, I tell you, that thing is, takes so much strength in your hands. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. First time you're done, you feel like Popeye. All the muscles that you've never used before, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's exhilarating. So, and I just got back from a trip in Nicaragua where we were, where we were horseback riding, which I love to do. It, even though I'm not experienced at it, but I'm, I feel very comfortable with it. Sand surfing, we're zip lining. And to me, I'm, I'm recommitting to myself to be outdoors as much as I can doing fun stuff because yeah. it, it's like a supercharge to me when I'm out there doing mm-hmm. that. The, sun, the sun's on you and you're doing those challenging things and you, and you, you earn a really good, tired feeling, you know, because yep. um, you, you fully, fully engage yourself. To me, that's... that's I love it. You know, I love it. How about the one thing that you cannot live without? Um, boy, I, 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 I mean, obviously, I want my family to be well. The one I come from, the one I've, I've, I've created as well. Um, that's the most important thing for me um, and my friends. And, um, mm-hmm. But as far as materially, there's almost nothing I can't do without them. I'm, I'm okay with, them, with almost anything. So Okay. Yeah. Okay. How about... What would your backup plan be if one day you woke up and you just decided that you didn't want to do this real estate game anymore? What what would be the uh, the alternate life of Justin Ford? I would uh, I'd open a small restaurant um, and it'd be like you know maybe twenty see twenty twenty five people and I just cook because I used to live in Italy lived in France I lived in South mm-hmm. America traveled around a bit and I love I love great food and I love good wine and I might just make meals I thought were, were interesting would be a very small menu and it would be very limited hours I okay. just feel like coming. Just cook for people who enjoy the, the meal. I've, I've gone to a few of these types of restaurants in like Italy occasionally. And, um, and to me, that would probably be cool, a cool thing to do. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Where your patrons basically become your extended family. I love it. Kinda, yeah, yeah, right. Well, Justin, this has been a lot of fun. Really appreciate you coming to the show. Lots of incredible information shared uh, throughout the last 40 to 45 minutes or so. And what I'd like to ask of you is if you just had one final golden nugget of advice or wisdom that you can leave with our listeners today that may inspire and motivate them as they progress in their real estate investing career. What would that one last golden nugget be? Um, oh my boy, I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> um, the last golden nugget would be, um, if, 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 if the project makes sense, whatever you're doing, if it makes sense and you've gone off track, you know, whatever you've gone over budget or things are difficult and so forth, but it still makes sense. Um, you know, Put yourself last if other people are invested in that project, whatever it is. Put yourself last. And if you persist and persist and just get on, on track, you might not end up with a home run. You might not end up with a grand slam. You might not even make any money yourself, but you'll have honored your obligations. You'll finish that project, and that will be worth uh, equity in more ways than you can imagine.
Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. And I think the, another important factor there is just the, uh, you know, have the utmost transparency throughout the entirety of the process, even more important if it's not going as planned, right? Right. You you find that I've I've seen it happen many different times, uh, you know, where, you know, investors put out projections um, or, you know, responses put out projections and, you know, things never go as planned, right? Just, you know that Uh, you've been involved in many projects. Things never go exactly as planned. Sometimes they go better and sometimes they go worse. And, uh, but very, I I have never had the better one on on renovations. I've never had the better one. Sorry. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. But the the importance is transparency with your investors. They're your partners. Um, They took the ride with you. Be sure to give them absolute clarity, no matter whether it's good news or bad news. And so with that, Justin, it's been a lot of fun having you here. Really appreciate you coming to the show. And folks, if you want to learn more about Justin and the, the various projects that he has in the works, you can go visit his two different websites. The one is paxproperties.com and that's P-A-X, again, paxproperties.com. And then his hotel website, which is paxhotelgroup.com. Again, paxhotelgroup.com. And I'll be sure to put that in the show notes. Uh, also, as I mentioned in the middle of the show there, be sure to go check out um, the most recent project he has up there in Tallahassee, uh, which is Seven Hills Suite. Uh, and Justin, the website was sevenhillssuites.com, correct? Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay. That's okay. Well, fantastic. Well, Justin, thanks you, thank you again for coming to the show. And guys, thank you for tuning into this week's show. And until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. You guys take care now. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.